Hello and welcome. I am Exit Light and this is my podcast and my podcast buddy is here. Hello, Rob. Hi, Hi Tracer. What's going on, Rob? Well, the sun's out. So I'm going to have a barbecue this weekend with my daughters mm. and... It's going to be absolutely boiling, but I promised them a barbecue for the last four months. And every weekend I get them, it rains. So this weekend, um, we're having a barbecue and I can't wait. How hot is it going to be there? Um, It's going to be up in the 90s this weekend, Mm. which is, I know that's like a winter's day for you. But um, (laughs) um, on Monday, it's going to be up in the hundreds, hundred and summer. Oh, that's hot no matter where you are. Um, and then it's going to thunderstorm by on Wednesday. Mm, lucky. See, the, the, pro- the problem is in this country is when it gets hot, it, it's really, really, really hot. And then it starts to go humid. And mm. It's just, you're just soaking all the time. Mm-hmm. Constantly. Mhm. Look with a fan up my ass. I'm sorry. <laughs> what? I don't even. What did you say? <laughs> to walk around with a fan up my ass. What's the word? I don't understand. The what up your ass? Fan. 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 Well, I'm not sure that's going to help you very much. <laughs> Might make you walk faster. <laughs> well, of course, it's hotter than the face of the sun in Texas. So we have heat warnings every day. And this is my favorite thing when they're like, it's 105, but it feels like 110. Uh, then it's 110. What does that even mean? If it feels like 110, it's 110. There you go. I went. I went to the doctor this this week. Uh, actually, went twice in the last week, um, and both times walking out of the doctor's office, my doctor said, "Good luck," because of the heat, which makes you feel, you know, safe when your doctors wish you luck out there in the open. Yeah, it's hot. We hope you make it to the car. Nigel told me last night, my friend Nigel, mm-hmm. that he's got an air con, he's got an air conditioner in his bedroom. Mm-hmm. And it keeps the bedroom really cold. Mm-hmm. And I said, thanks for telling me that. Maybe I want to kill myself. Does it cool down at night? Well, it does in his bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, in general, does the weather cool down at night? Not, not really. No, just, days, oh. just, just really, really hot. But see, where I grew up in Washington, it could, it was, it really like ninety was like your max, low nineties maybe. But then it it cooled off so much at night that you could wear like a sweater, and I I never appreciated that until I moved to Arizona, which is the demon's holiday ground and then texas which is inhabited by satan i think and uh and then i realized what hot was and that in arizona it doesn't cool down at night because the um all the concrete streets and stuff they're not supposed to be in a desert and then the desert is all like super hard, hard, hard soil, you know, and yeah. clay and everything. So the concrete and asphalt soaks up the heat. Yeah. So at two o'clock in the morning, it's still 110. Oh. But in Arizona, you know, in, in Texas, where I live, um, it's super, super green. It's really interesting because you walk outside. People, I think people think that Texas is like a, a desert. And uh, there are parts of Texas that are desert, but the majority, the mo- most of Texas um, 
is like um, a tropical environment because, you know, because of the Gulf Coast. So uh, I don't think most people think about that, that it's super green and lush with all kinds of trees and ferns and, and you know, it's, and it's, it's, it's pretty and it uh, cools down. I think probably because there's so many trees and stuff that that helps. And nobody cares. Why do they care? They're like, well, talk, I, didn't, I didn't come here for this. Talking about trees, that's a good way of getting on to what we're going to be talking about today. What are we talking about today? We're talking about the Appalachian. I think you're supposed to say it Appalachian. 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 Yeah. Right. Appalachian. Appalachian. Yeah. I think we do this at least once per podcast. Don't you? Don't you? Like, you'll go, how's that pronounced? And then we'll spend 30 seconds by saying it back and forth. (laughs) <laughs> I think it's, it's very funny. Um, before we get started on that, though, uh, if you guys would please give this video a thumbs up. Uh, it's really great for my channel. It helps it to be recommended to other people who are interested in these kind of topics. And if you could share my videos, that would be really great. I just saw on my analytics that 90% of the people who listen to this channel are not subscribed. Would you please take one moment and subscribe for me, please? That also helps my channel a whole lot. Helps me to grow and uh, helps people to be brought here. And I would appreciate that so much. Okay, so we're talking about Appalachian folklore monsters stuff, right? Yep. And... um, I have a whole bunch of Appalachian stuff saved because, as you know, Rob, in two months, I will begin preparing for the 31 days of Halloween, which is hard to imagine, but uh, it makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. So uh, I have a whole bunch of Appalachian stuff saved up because it is the... And what I like about the United States is that, like, any given state is, like, a completely different country. And the states that uh, encompass the Appalachians are um, very much unique in a way that I don't think any other states are. And so it makes it very interesting because they, you know, there are... uh, New Orleans has its superstitions and all that stuff, um, which are lovely, and I enjoy them. But Appalachia is a completely different beast, and uh, and I find that to be very interesting. Do you? Yes, very much so. Yeah, a lot of the stuff I've been uh, intrigued about for a long time. Yeah. Okay. Well, then... Can I can I start by saying something? You can, yes. Okay, so I stumbled upon. I actually, uh, the algorithm on TikTok gives me uh, uh, Appalachian Appalachian content providers, which is perfect. Um, and I stumbled across this woman who uh, was talking about her childhood being raised in the Appalachian Mountains, and she was telling a she was telling a few stories and if, if, uh, if it's okay, I would like to convey, uh, I would like to convey them to everybody. And, um, uh, one of them was going to be the start of our Appalachian mountain cryptid conversation. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. So, um, she was saying that when she was growing up, all the kids, you know, they're growing up in the, on the, there's a tree line and then, you know, they're whatever they live in is, you know, before the tree line, they're cut down. So they have the property. She said that, um, everybody's parents told them that if they were ever going into the forest, into the woods, that they had to tell their parents because, um, 
for those of you who haven't heard before, if you hear something call your name in the woods, you do not. You do not answer. You do not stop. You do not talk about it. You keep going. If you hear somebody whistle in the woods, you do not respond. And you never go in the woods yourself and whistle because you will get a response. And the thing is, these traditions and folklore and legends are so old. This is this is a part of the country that is so old and established and has so many different uh, groups that came to this part of the country to settle from from Native Americans, which you know have their their own belief system and folklore. Uh, people came from people left slave states and they though they were in slave states and went to the Appalachian Mountains. So you have some uh, Caribbean folklore and legend. There's um, all there's French, Italian. So it's uh, it's a it originally was a mishmash of all kinds of different um, ethnic groups and all of their belief systems, and then you know they all have melded into a community, and now that's several you know a couple hundred years ago, but these legends from the Appalachian Mountains are so, so believed by the people who live there. There's not a doubt in their mind. Not one doubt. It's like saying the sky is blue and they're that sure about these legends, what's in the mountains, and what will happen to you. Which I find fascinating because if there's anybody I'm going to believe, it's them. Yeah. They've lived there. They know this area like the back of their hands. And they grew up there. So I tend to lean on the side of these legends, folklore, have lasted for so long. And we say all the time that there's usually a, a foundation in truth. So if I am ever having the misfortune of being in the forest in the Appalachian Mountains and I am alone I will not answer to my name I will not answer to a whistle if it looks like a person I'm still walking by it but she said that they they were told when they went into the woods to tell their parents and also to never answer their name being called under any circumstances so they would tell their parents and their parents would give them a word to answer to, to let them know it was them, you know, just some word, you know, whatever, corn, you know, peas. So that the children would know when they were being called in for whatever reason, dinner time, bedtime, that it was their parents and they could answer that call. They were to leave the woods, but otherwise they were told never under any circumstances leave the woods if somebody's calling your name to never go towards that voice and I think that is fascinating and a frightening way to grow up and you wouldn't have found me in the woods yeah uh, although I guess if you grow up that way it's just it's 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 normal and then she was talking about this she says there's a lot of old deserted cabins and houses in the Appalachian Mountains and they have always been told, you do not, under any circumstances, go into any one of these cabins or homes, ever. Because what they look like on the outside is not what they are on the inside. And you can be trapped. So she said that her and her friends, um, there was an old cabin in the woods by their house. And she, they were teenagers, and they thought it was all crock of crap. So 
they went specifically looking for trouble, as teenagers do, and went to this old cabin that had been there forever. The They said that they have seen, like, through the windows, rain. When it was raining outside, they could see that the rain fell through the brook broken down roof and they could see it going down into the house the the stairs were decrepit everything was decrepit and old and and had plants uh growing up sides and even had a tree growing right straight up in the middle of this house which is apparently i would assume what contributed to the broken roof so they decided they were going to go in you know, teenagers know better than their parents and their grandparents, their great grandparents, their great great grandparents. So they go in. And she said that everything was immaculate. It looked like somebody that was uh, was living there in the nineteen fifties. There was no dust. The roof was not broken. There was it was a home with furniture. And an old TV set and a dining room table and everything that you would need in a kitchen. It was all perfect. So her and her friends, and she gave their her friends actual first and last names, which I will not do. <laughs> not my business. She said that they started to sift through drawers, you know, looking for stuff. That on the table, the dining room table, Next to a, a, like a what would have been a cup of coffee, and a saucer was an old newspaper from 1954. Perfect condition, wasn't old. It was looked brand new. Everything they found in the cupboards, not broken, beautiful condition. And they started to hear their parents calling them. Oh. Now their parents did not did not know that they were in the woods, so they were thinking not falling for that but eventually they decided that they would go back home and when they walked out of the tree line their parents were frantic and crying their moms crying and scared and was were hugging them and they didn't understand why their parents were in this shape. And uh, one of the kids said, we were only gone for like 25 minutes. And the mom said, we've been looking for you for eight hours. Wow. Yeah. Crazy, right? Very much so. Yeah. I want to go. Um, and then here's this. She said she was a descendant of Chief Cornstalk. And let me tell you uh, uh, a little thing about Chief Cornstalk. There's much known about him, but here is what I could find. Um, let's see. Chief Cornstalk was born around 1720. He died in November 1777. He was a Shawnee leader in the Ohio country in the 1760s and the 1770s. His name in the Shawnee language was Hokulesqua. Little is known about his early life, but he may have been born in the province of Pennsylvania. In 1763, he reportedly led a raid against British American colonists in Pontiac's War. He first appears in historical documents in 1764 when he was one of the hostages surrendered to the British as part of the peace negotiations ending Pontiac's war. He was murdered while he was in prison. He also fought in the um, French Indian War, French and Indian War. So she says that he, she is a relative of his well, her family legend goes that when he was imprisoned, the Native American, uh, not, I, I'll, I'm, I'm not saying all of them, but 
his, the Shawnee, believe in what is called the Thunderbird. And um, that's a very tall, tall, it's usually, it's usually, uh, it's usually, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Depicted, depicted to be tall and blue and has wings that go out on the side. Obviously the wings are outstretched and um, kind of rectangular. And if you live in America, you might have seen this in, in, in on Indian reservations or Indian casinos. They oftentimes have the Thunderbird um, on it somewhere in their depiction for safety. So, um, but the legend was that they could use the Thunderbird for safety or for war. And he believed that the Thunderbird had not protected him. And so he cursed the Thunderbird to fly and walk the earth, attacking the descendants of the people who attacked him. And the Thunderbird is now known as the Mothman. which this woman completely believes is a true story and that there is a Mothman that was conjured up by a curse from her grandfather yeah. against the Thunderbird. So I thought that was very interesting. And um, we, when you were I talking about what to do for the podcast, you were talking about Appalachian folklore and stuff, and I was like, oh, let's do because I want to tell a story about that. I've never heard that story about... Um, Mothman before. It's unique and interesting. Yeah. Now, um, you know, I don't know that I particularly believe in the Mothman, but um, if, as far as I'm concerned, if the Appalachian people say there's something, then there's probably something. Yeah. And I'm just going to stay away. All right. So, do you want to talk? About an Appalachian monster slash cryptid. Well, um, I'd like to talk about. <coughs> go, I lost it. I'd like to talk about. Um, it's not so much a cryptid, mm-hmm. but um, there it is. Finally. Sorry, guys. I'm just. Could, could I possibly talk about the Brown Mountain Lights? Sure. Because I watched the documentary, well, I watched a couple of documentaries on this, mm-hmm. and basically, you can go. There was a study done by um, a university in America mm-hmm. about these lights, and the picture that I'm looking at now is like a, an area where you could stand. Overlooking, okay. overlooking the mountains, the brown mountains, and they actually, the documentary when they were filming the documentary, the documentary filmed them filming these lights. And you can see the lights darting about, and what they did, they were able to work out where the lights were in relation to the. The surrounding area, hmm. and a lot of people were saying, "Well, it was it was car headlights and things like that." Mm-hmm. Well, where the lights were coming from, there, there are no roads. It, it's basically thick wooded, a thick wooded area, mm-hmm. and the lights were too high up. They could they could work out the elevation of the lights as well, and it was above the tree line. Um, and it, it was absolutely fascinating to see these lights. And it's one of the things I would love to go and experience is to see the lights playing lights dancing around pretty much every night. I think that um, scientists have said that they've seen them, right? Yeah, they were they were actually filming the scientists watching the and filming them. Mm. Some people, of course, say it's swamp gas, right? 
Yeah, but when you when you actually see the lights, you can tell it's not swamp gas. That that's always the explanation for all lights. People say, oh, yeah. swamp gas, which is well, weird. I'm just going to read what it says here. Okay. Found in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, the Brown Mountain Lions are a true Appalachian or Appalachia or whatever it's called mountain mystery. Locals and tourists alike have reported glowing orb-like lights in blue, white, orange and red hovering approximately 15 feet off the ground in the Brown Mountains area of Morganton. Morganton, NC. I presume the NC is North Carolina. Yes. Legend tells of a brutal battle between the Cherokee and Catawaba warriors on the Brown Mountains, which left many dead on the battlefield. In the evenings, the Catawaba women went searching for their sons, husbands, brothers and fathers, using torchlights to guide them. Many claim that the lights seen today are the spirits of the Catawaba women still searching for their loved ones. The first recorded sight of the Brown Mountain Lights in 1771, when German engineer John William Gerard de Brown um, wrote about seeing the lights in his journal. But his written accounts stated that the, the, he saw lights at a constant time every night, leading many to believe he was actually seeing train lights in the distance. Recorded accounts of the Brown Mountain Lights sighting happens throughout the 20th century, especially in the Linville area. Sorry, gained access to electricity. While reported sightings of the colourful lights are known for their inconsistency, the lights are typically seen at night, especially after rainfall. The Brown Mountain Overlook Wiseman's View. That's what that's the picture I can see. It must be what the Wiseman's look. It's like um, a concrete area with a small wall where you can overlook the whole of the mountains. That's where they had all the cameras set up um, filming these lights. Um, it's an absolutely fascinating thing if you ever get the chance Trace, to see this documentary. It's, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. What's the name of it? It's the, the the name of the documentary. Yeah. The Brown Mountain Lights. Oh, that is what the name is. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's sorry. Yeah, it's called the Brown Mountain Lights because okay. it, um there was um it's probably still on now. There was it used to be a TV program on, on History Channel called the Ancient Aliens. Yeah. Um. It was they they featured on a couple of episodes of that as well, because a lot of people think it could be down to UFOs and um, and because they've been coming for such a long time that the, the lights have been there since since the sort of seventeen hundreds. Um, they think it could be something to do with ancient aliens, and they've, they've this there's a lot of ley lines that cross in the Brown Mountains. Right. And they think it could be something to do with the ley lines and the UFOs. And you know, speaking of UFOs, the U.S. Congress just passed a resolution this week uh, to have a committee to gather um, information on on UFOs and to take um, sightings and put them in these records. And this world is so effed up right now that. Um, it barely made the news. Well, well, yeah, the world is in such a state. But they used to do this, didn't they, in the um, Project Blue? Nineties, yeah, so yeah. But they're saying it out that they what that wasn't that, that wasn't public knowledge at the time. No, it wasn't. You're right. And we didn't find out till later, and that was because they were they were going to close that committee. But now they're just like literally. There's a little piece in the news that says, "Oh, by the way." Congress passed a resolution to have a UFO committee to gather information. And in other news, uh, 
the price of gas is really high. You know, like, wait, wait a minute. Can we go back to the uh, UFO thing for a minute? Yeah. Can we can we talk a little bit more about that? Well, it's like during the COVID, they they came out and said that the there is, yes. there is UFOs are real. I know, and nobody ever like okay, but I I have to wear a mask. Well, <laughs> yeah, they we're being invaded by aliens, but I am wearing a mask. Can we deal with that first? Can we tell them to come back? The aliens must have been like, what's wrong with these people? I know. The aliens are like, they're just like, yeah. yeah. They're like, boo. That didn't work. I'm going to I'm gonna fly by you really, really fast. Boo. And they were like, yeah, 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 yeah. But have you seen the price of bread? <laughs> Got back to it all anyway. What are you talking about? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Right? Yeah. There's a toilet paper shortage for God's sakes. Yeah. That's that's sort of our reaction, which is um shocking to me. Yeah. And I don't think they're getting I don't think they're getting what they came for. Um but it's, it's just that is no, that is just that is just weird to me that how blase we've come about everything. Yeah. That there can literally be PS there are 6,000 serial killers on the loose at any given moment in the United States. Aliens exist. And um, water is wet. <coughs> oh, okay. All right, anyway. Well, duh. All right. So I'm going to do the Wampus Beast this is a large, black, feline-like creature, and it lives, shockingly enough, in the woods, as opposed to in an apartment in the city. And has been spotted around Pleasance County, which is in West Virginia. Wampus beasts are four times the size of a male mountain lion and weigh in at 500 to 600 pounds with massive paws, the predators have a strong odor, odor like a cross between a wet dog and a skunk. Nice. I've, I've actually heard people who say that they've seen this. All right. Like on TikTok, not TikTok, YouTube videos. Yeah, that it's like a big black cat. As a matter of fact, scientists say that if it does exist, it came from... They think it came from somebody bringing this type of giant, enormous leopard thing from a different con country and letting it go. But I don't think they live 200 years. You know, I'm just saying. Especially if it was just one let go. Unless it bred with something else. And... Bigfoot. He smells bad. <laughs> and I really had an inappropriate joke. Really, if it was just you and I on the on the telephone, I would have shocked the hell out of you just now. Okay. Again. Uh, okay. What do you want to talk about? The Flatwood Monster. Okay. The Flatwoods Monster, I should say. Another popular myth in Appalachia folklore the flatwood the flatwoods monster orientated in braxton county west virginia on september the 12th 1952 edward may freddie may neil nutley and tommy hyler were playing at fleetwoods elementary when they spotted a light shooting across the sky on their way to see the light, the boys stopped to tell their mother, Kathleen May, who asked the, asked the National Guardsman, Eugene Lemon, to join them. When they arrived at the site of the light crash, they saw a pulsing light around 10 foot, 
sorry, when they arrived at the site of the lightest crash, they saw pulsing red lights and a 10 foot creature with twisted <laughs> twisted hands, glowing green face, I seen to lev levitate off the ground. When the creature hissed at them, they fled. The event made local and national news and even promoted the, uh, U the official US Air Force and, a, and a, an official US Air Force inquiry. Today, tourists come from all over the country to see the home of the Flatwood Monster to learn about this Appalachian scary story. You can visit the Flatwoods Monster Museum in Sutton, West, West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to stop at the spot along the way when you find the alien themes. Oh, God. Only in America. Oh, my God. What is in this? What is in this museum? You can buy an alien themed sandwich. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, my God. And yeah, that's American. Flatwood monster souvenirs and a sandwich. What 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 is this sandwich made out of though? Well, who knows? Who Flatwood knows? monster be meat. Oh no! It's mystery meat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, okay then. Let me see, Rob. I'm going to talk about, um, since I went from a cat, I'm going to go to a dog. The Wolfman. A lot of... Oh, Is that what you just said? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that is exactly. I have found him. <laughs> a large canine-esque mammal is roaming the hills near Wolf County, Kentucky. Believed to weigh about 500 pounds and what? stand taller than seven feet in height. The wolf man is bipedal and has fur similar to a bear or a gorilla. It is believed to live in caves and has been seen around the area since the 1970s. See, the ones that are seen in relatively recent history, I don't know about that. I mean, people have been living there for a long time. They didn't notice the wolf man. I don't. Could it not just be a bear? Yeah, I think it's probably a bear. That's what I'm gonna say. I mean, they do think that. <laughs> do you know how you know how much better that sounds in in your type of English? Couldn't that be just a bear? Oh, dear me. <laughs> well, you know, you've got an area where, obviously, if there was an area where there weren't, there weren't any bears, you could say, yeah. well, obviously, it can't be, it's very going to be very, very, you're not going to let a bear go. You're not going to keep it as a pet and then just let it go. Once it's exactly. <laughs> well, this, I bought this bear and it was only a little Most little people. Seven foot tall now, and I just can't go with it. <laughs> just had no idea. <laughs> I thought it was going to stay small. I don't, I don't know. I couldn't it's, feed it anymore. I had to let it go. Yeah, and some people might notice the fact that you had a seven foot bear, and now you haven't. And then <laughs> all of a sudden, there's this wolf man running around the countryside, scaring the hell out of everybody. <laughs> Wait a minute! Didn't Billy Bob used to have a seven foot bear? <laughs> Could it be that? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good accent, that by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, dear me. Yeah, I don't know about that one. Okay, your turn, my friend. Well, I'll, I'll take your bear or your okay. wolf man. Okay. And I'll, and I'll give you a moon eyed people. Okay. According to both Appalachian folk tales and Cherokee legend, a group of pale-skinned humanoids called the Moon-Eyed People might be hiding somewhere in the Appalachian Range, typically associated with the small town of Murphy, North Carolina. The Moon-Eyed People are short, stout, white-skinned, with beard, bearded face. Me. <laughs> <laughs> 
beardy faces. <laughs> and and large, the large blue eyes. Their eyes are supposed to be so sensitive to the sun that they remain nocturnal. This is why they're called moon eyed. Legends say that the local Native American tribes waited for the full moon to drive the moon eyed people from their underground caves. The bright light made them weak, forcing them to flee to other parts of the island. Well, if they didn't bother the local, the local Native American tribes, why yeah. would they want to spend time driving them out of the caves? I don't know. I think that there's also supposed to be moon-eyed people. I think it might be Mount Hood in Oregon. I think so. I think yeah, I think it's Mount Hood. No, is that so Mount Hood? And I think so. And they've supposedly found like the bodies of these creatures, the little well, tiny people. It says here actually, unlike other Appalachian monsters, the moon-eyed people were considered to be a distinctly separate race of people rather than supernatural beings it might seem it might seem obvious to readers but the moon eyed people were mostly most likely just european settlers but what makes the legend so shocking is that it dates back hundreds of years before christopher columbus discovered america okay christopher columbus didn't discover america but okay so the moon eyed people another appalachian mountain scary story or just the european settlers who reached who received their due credit today's <laughs> oh, I was just thinking if they saw if Native Americans had never seen a white person a blue eyed white person with round eyes you know big blue eyes could they have been like that's a what the F <laughs> we need to get rid of those I mean, isn't that possible? I mean, they said it's before, you know, whatever, Christopher Columbus, which didn't happen. But uh, what do you mean? Did there, Christopher Columbus didn't didn't discover America. Who did that? Uh, something Americana, some Italian. Uh, I believe. Don't please do not. Uh, Please do not hold me to that. But it wasn't Christopher Columbus, which is why we don't celebrate Columbus Day really anymore. All right. well because uh, he he thought he was in Asia somewhere. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. He, he was in a completely different place, really. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't find it. But anyway, that's a. I don't know want to talk about that. But. Uh, but, I mean, if you have never seen anybody but people like you, then might it not be frightening to see an English settler who looks well, yeah. completely like nothing you've seen before? So I'm just saying maybe maybe that is where it came from. Yeah, maybe. I don't know, but I don't want one. But like I said, I think there's some uh, stories of that in Mount Hood too. Okay, so here's uh, I'm gonna stay on the dog track. A smoke wolf. The solid black smoke wolf wolf is a mass of canine with eyes as red as the sun. One witness who has heard smoke wolves howl and scream at night on his property describes them as pure evil, noting that they kill for fun. The only thing known to deter a smoke wolf is the sound of rattling chains. They went through everything else. They shot weapons, they screamed, the dogs barked, and they picked up some chains and were like, how about this? Yeah, that was the one. Have you ever heard? Have you ever heard? Uh, I think they're bobcats. Have you ever heard bobcat screams? On Have you ever heard the YouTube videos of them? No. Oh my goodness, Rob, and everybody else. 
when you're done with this, go look up bobcat screams. Because they sound like human females screaming for help when they're, like, fighting or mating. Okay. Same thing. Same thing. Uh, they scream, help! And it's it's the most frightening. It's, uh, it's no wonder that people think that there's people that they're afraid of what's in the mountains, if this is what they're hearing, because I'm afraid of it too. But, and then the other people go, oh, it's just bobcats. That's just bobcats. I don't know about this. Have you heard cats when they're on heat? Yeah. Oh, I hate that noise. Do you? This is not like that. This, no. this is not like that. This is like a woman being tortured, and I mean tortured. It is something you're not going to forget. And they look it up because it's horrific. Yeah. And I, I don't know if it's one of those things that they just go, no, it's bobcats or mountain lions. One of those things, something to do with a cat. Uh, I don't know if they just make an excuse because, you know, scientific people don't want to sometimes believe in supernatural kind of things so it's just easier to go oh that's explainable uh i don't know you guys listen for yourselves leave me a comment and tell me what is happening what is that noise is this a bobcat getting it on or not one guy no i saw this guy comment on one of the videos and he said that his that he and his brother had heard this noise in the woods. Now, this is just a comment, anonymous, on a video. Could be anything. He said that they heard this scream in the woods, and uh, they went to go check it out, and they did find a woman who had who had gotten loose out of being tied up and had been um, asphalted. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that she had been screaming. And people were like, oh, I'm so glad that you didn't write it off as, you know, the, this cat thing. Uh, I don't know, you guys. Go go, go, take a listen and then give me your opinion because I'd like to hear it. You, you too, of course, Rob. Okay. Uh, you're up. Well, this is my last one, if that's okay. Yes. Um, it's the most famous one. I think, out of all okay. of them, the Bell Witch. Everybody's heard the Bell Witch. I would have thought by now. Well, they will have done if they'd listened to us. Yes. <laughs> yes. The legend come, centers around the Bell family. The Bell Witch, who's thought to be a woman named Kate Batts, was supposedly cheated in a land purchase by John Bell. The no, I never heard that before. No, I haven't heard that fact, actually. Um, by uh, the patriarch uh, the patriarch of the Bell family. Haunted began sometimes between 1817 and 1821, when the Bell witch would show up disguised as an animal, such as a dog or a bird. She would often focus on John's daughter, Betsy Bell, pulling the sheets off her bed or even physically harming her with kicks, punches or scratches. John Bell grew so concerned by these violent escalations that he shared his story with a family friend, James Johnson. Hey. 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 <laughs> hey. 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 <laughs> After Johnson experienced the spirit first hand, word quickly began to spread. The Appalachian ghost story eventually became famous enough to reach General Andrew Jackson. According to the legend, Jackson and his party set up tents outside the Bell Home, one man claiming he had knowledge of how to deal with witches, boasted that his silver bullets would keep the witch at bay. To punish him, 
the witch set her sights on the man, giving him the giving him a beating that had Jackson's men begging to leave. Hmm. John Bell, after John Bell's mysterious death in 1820, the Bell witch continued to hunt and haunt his family. She even forced Betsy to break off her engagement with Joshua Gardner. A lot of people with names beginning with J in this story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Her engagement with Joshua Gardner before eventually disappearing for good. Some stories claim that she promised to return to haunt John Bell's direct descendants in 1935, but there were no reports by Nashville, Nashville physical physician, sorry, Dr. Charles Bailey Bell. So, yeah. Hmm. Well, I have one. One more. Okie dokie. I'm still in the dog category. The oh, I'm going to talk about Grimm's. Here we go. This is a good one. These red-eyed beasts guard some Appalachian cemeteries. Legend has it that settlers throughout the region believe that burying the family dog alive in the cemetery would mean the dog spirit would morph into a Grimm. A black dog with red eyes, and that the dog would protect the graveyard. Mm, why that? would you do that? I, I don't understand. Those poor dogs. <sighs> that, that's a weird one. It's a bit of a weird one to end on. I know. Some of their beliefs, you know, I always wonder, like, let's let's say 200 years from now, what are gonna, people going to look back on us and be like, oh, my God, they're such idiots. You know, that's like that we look at now, like, and think that, you know, like believing in or hanging witches or whatever was, it was, you know, ridiculous. And just things that we look back on now and think, you know, like bloodletting to cure somebody, just drain their blood out of them. Well, that's a good idea. Uh, what well, the people are going to look back on us and think that was so ridiculous. I don't know, but I think one of the top three should be burying your dog alive. Yeah. Call me crazy, and people do, especially you, Rob. Me. <laughs> Don't have a go at me. <laughs> All right, you guys. I hope you have enjoyed this podcast and uh, all the different beasts we have talked about. I have. I like this topic. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. All right, Rob, thank you for coming. Uh, you guys, please give this video a thumbs up. Share with friends. Share with family. Friend, w- Share with your mortal enemies. I don't care. Always, Use me to torture them. Always a pleasure. Never a chill. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And subscribe, you guys. Subscribe. Yep. It's free. It doesn't, it's painless, mostly. And uh, it really helps my channel. Okay, guys. All right, you guys. Good night. Bye. Bye.